Please stand. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Amen. We read from 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. This is God's word. Please be seated. Dear fellow children of God, if you've ever taken a communications class you've probably seen this illustration. In order for good communication to take place, there must be a sender, message, and a receiver. If you worshiped with us last week, we focused on that truth that God speaks to us through his word in the Bible. This week we'll be looking at the other side of the equation, how we speak to God in prayer. But this dynamic of God's word and our prayers often puts us mortals in challenging situations. Because we don't get that instant feedback of face-to-face communication. Our prayers can often leave us feeling more like this. We feel like we're left hanging. Wondering if our prayers were heard, wondering and waiting for what the answer will be. Now, if God were to leave us in this anxious state, we might be tempted to give up on prayer altogether. But thanks be to God that he does speak to us through his word. And in that word, he takes away our doubt and uncertainty. Did you notice in our reading how John brings together two thoughts that we often, rarely put together? Those two thoughts are praying and knowing. Because we often pray because we don't know. We don't know the future. We don't know what will happen or could happen. We pray for things that are beyond our ability to control, beyond our comprehension. John tells us to put the knowing back into praying. Specifically, he says there are three things that we as God's children need to know about prayer. We need to know God's will. Know that he hears us and know that we have what we have asked of him. Now this certainty of knowing was just as important for John's initial readers as it is for us today. You see, they were being led astray by false teachers called Gnostics, who among other things taught that the real way to God was not through faith in Christ, but rather through secret knowledge, which they, of course, possessed. In this cult, members would go from one secret step of knowledge to another to another, supposedly climbing their way up to God. In response, John wanted to reassure his readers of the rock-solid relationship that they enjoyed with God through his son, Jesus Christ. Earlier in this letter, John had said, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, And that is what we are. Later after that, he clarifies how that sonship takes place. He says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Everyone who looks to Jesus Christ as the appointed Savior of humanity, the one whose blood atones for our sins, All such persons are born of God. You and I are heirs of the Lord of the universe. 
and as his adopted children, we enjoy all the many blessings that he showers upon us, first and foremost of all being forgiveness of sins and eternal life. So then John could say in summarizing his letter up this far, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. We have eternal life guaranteed to us in our Savior. Notice how before John even comes to the issue of prayer, he builds us up. He reminds us that we come before God holy and cleansed of sin in Jesus. That we can approach God through Jesus as our dear Father. A Father who has already given us the most priceless gift eternal life. So with that confidence, with that fearlessness, we can now go into the three things that John says we need to know about prayer. The first is we need to know what God's will is. John says if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Let's think about this first of all in purely human terms. It doesn't matter how politely your three-year-old son asks for his turn to operate the chainsaw, the answer will always be the same. No. And if the son keeps it up, he's likely to be ignored. So too, no earthly father worth his salt will give his child something that they plan to use for immoral or illegal purposes. It's the same with our Heavenly Father. He will not grant our requests when we pray for things that he knows may hurt us. Nor will he listen to us when we ask for things from a desire to please our sinful nature or our own selfishness. If our prayers are to be heard, we need to know what kinds of things God wants us to ask for. So, how do we ascertain what God's will is. Does he whisper back to us when we pray? Does he lead us through life based on our emotions? Should we be walking around looking for signs from above? The writer to the Hebrews answers all these questions in the negative. He begins his letter by simply saying, In the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets, at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Where do we hear Jesus speak to us? We hear him speak in his word, in the Bible. Like Jesus' disciple in our gospel lesson, we come to him and say, Lord, teach us to pray. Jesus then gave his disciples and us that model prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Now, though it's not the only prayer we can pray, And it's not the only thing we can say to God. It is a prayer whose every petition and request is perfectly in line with God's will. The Lord's Prayer reminds us that our primary concerns in life should be for things spiritual. Keeping His name holy, advancing His kingdom, submitting to His will, seeking His mercy and forgiveness for our sins, looking to Him for protection from evil. And yes, all the while, also looking only to his hand to supply our physical needs as well. But as we learn God's word and hear his promises, we also hear that prayer demands trust. Because there are many things about our lives that God has not revealed. God has not revealed every single aspect of his will and his plans for us. God doesn't say that it's his will that each of us be married or have children or be prosperous. God doesn't promise to heal that illness, cure that cancer, or take away that depression. He just doesn't say. Now much as that weighs down on us and burdens us and pains our hearts, 
it also reminds us that God is our almighty heavenly Father and we are totally dependent upon him, upon his grace and mercy as his children. And those things also drive us to the Lord in prayer so that we ask him for his Holy Spirit who alone can strengthen us so that we cling to the promise that his love is faithful no matter what he lead us through in life. John also says that when we ask with a humble heart, seeking God's will, God hears us. Have you ever wondered about all those other religions out there that say, well, God is just an impersonal spirit, just a life force? What does a life force have to hear? If a life force does hear, does it care about you as an individual? Why should it treat you any differently than an amoeba? How thankful we can be that God has revealed himself in his word as our Father who hears us. And this is not the preoccupied listening of an earthly father who doesn't always know what's best. This is the personalized, passionate attention of our Heavenly Father. The one who John had earlier described in his gospel as being love itself. Our God hears us. But more than that, John says, he hears us whatever we ask whether we're screaming at the top of our lungs or silently sobbing in the night. He hears. There is no request too big or too small for our God not to notice. Now I confess that for myself I often err on both sides of that line. I'm ashamed to think of how many times I have foregone prayer because I thought the matter was too insignificant for God to care, or so small that I can just handle it all by myself. And on the other side, perhaps you and I should reevaluate exactly how big our prayers actually are. When we pray, do we remember who we're praying to? That we're praying to the all-powerful Lord of all. That we're praying to the great I Am the one who created the universe out of nothing but words, whose almighty love made God and man in one person to suffer and die for the sins of all and rise unharmed from the grave? My friends, let's not sell God short. Let's not think that his arm is too weak to save us. We know that he hears us, whatever we ask, big or small. Lastly, John says that we need to know that we have what we have asked from him. Our Heavenly Father wants his sons and daughters to be absolutely certain that when we ask anything according to his will, he not only hears us, he promises to act. In his great love for us, our God has woven the petitions of all believers into his timeless governance of the world. Perhaps you've had stories in your own life where God has answered your prayers. Maybe he's even given you even more than you ever dreamed possible. Permit me to share one example from a book I read this last week that relates a story from a missionary in Zaire. The diary reads, a mother at our mission station died after giving birth to a premature baby. We tried to improve the incubator to keep the infant alive, but the hot water bottle was broken beyond repair. So during devotions that morning, the children prayed for the infant and her older sister, who was now an orphan. One girl prayed, Dear God, please send a hot water bottle today. Tomorrow will be too late because by then the baby will be dead. And dear Lord, send a doll for the sister so that she won't feel lonely. That afternoon, a large parcel arrived from England. Eagerly, the children watched as we opened it. 
much to their surprise, underneath the clothing was a hot water bottle. Immediately, the girl who had prayed started to delve deeper, exclaiming, If God sent that, I'm certain he sent a doll. And she was right. The Heavenly Father knew in advance of the child's request, and five months before, he had moved a ladies' group to include both these specific articles. By God's gift of the Holy Spirit, that little girl prayed confidently, boldly, knowing that God had the power to do everything that she asked. Along with the psalmist, she could say, My heart trusts in the Lord, and I am helped. With that same confidence, you and I can go to our Heavenly Father, laying our petitions out before His mercy, asking that His good will be done in our lives, and it will happen. In fact, John speaks even more emphatically. He doesn't say, know that it will happen. He says, know that you have it. It is done. Our God wants us to be certain that when we ask according to his will, that he will grant all of our requests knowing that his best way will be done. Through God's word today, we have been encouraged and strengthened so that we never have to fear this aspect of prayer ever again. You know who's on the other end of the line, your heavenly Father. Pray to him with boldness and confidence. Know that he is listening and that he will give you whatever you ask. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We now join in the responsive sermon song, 